insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 94. Fading Magic and Familiar Faces. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my dedicated and hardworking co host, Michelle Whalen. Aww, I See? feel so loved. Because you put so much effort into the podcast each week, doing all the notes and everything, and I appreciate it. Well, thank you. Uh, so, this week, we're, we're first of all, I want to I just sort of pat myself on the back because. We got another uh, copyright takedown for our uh, sequence transition music from uh, last week. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm sick and tired of dealing with that. So <laughs> I went into uh, uh, GarageBand on my tablet and decided to bang out just a couple of real simple transitions. You know, no one, no one produced right. these. They're not copywritten or anything like that. Right, so. right. <laughs> We're they're gonna, all yours. They're all mine. So we're gonna we're gonna start <laughs> out with those this week and see who I can anger this week with those. You know, it wouldn't be a week if we didn't piss off somebody. It, exactly. So, you know, exactly. Then we're not doing our job. <laughs> yeah. So at least at least someone's listening to it, right? Some right. algorithm somewhere, somewhere is paying attention. Yeah, exactly. So this week uh, we do have a number of articles to go through this week in our Disney Detective. We're gonna talk about Magical Express going away, which is kind of unfortunate we've taken advantage of that ourselves mm -hmm. and uh, another thing going away is annual passes at disneyland so the magic is fading rapidly from the disney parks it mm. seems then in our tales from the edge of the galaxy one of my favorite all-time books is coming back into canon in some form heir to the empire uh then uh, lucas another piece of really good news for me being a star wars gamer mm -hmm. is that ea no longer holds the monopoly on star wars yep. games so we'll talk about that coming see i knew you'd out. like our star star wars stuff today. absolutely all good news mm -hmm. all good news uh then in our entertainment news uh chris evans there's rumors of him reprising his possibly. role as captain america maybe maybe possibly uh and then we have a touching reunion between <laughs> negan touching. and touching in air quotes yes for our <laughs> Our listening audience. Right, right. Uh, between Negan and Maggie uh, in Walking Dead, which is coming back in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And then, as usual, we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. Sure will. Ready to get into it? Let's do it. All right. for Disney Detective. I feel like I should be waltzing while, while we're doing <laughs> that. Um, so we had some big Disney news, you know, come out during the week that obviously has a lot of people, you know, kind of up in arms. Uh, the first one is for our East Coast uh, Disney people, uh, and that would be that Disney World's Magical Express is going to be discontinuing service in 2022. Um, so, you know, they, they really didn't say what the main reason was behind this, but Obviously, with the health and safety procedures, like temperature checks and security systems, um, you know, modified park hopping and, and all these different changes, um, you know, they're kind of scaling down certain things. You know, one of the announcements they had made that magic bands were no longer going to be uh, given away free if you had a resort stay. So now you have to if you want a magic band, you have to purchase one or you have to use one 
uh, that you've previously used before. And now it seems that the next thing to kind of go away is the Magical Express. So beginning January 1st, 2022, Disney's Magical Express will no longer be available for transportation to and from the Orlando International Airport. Uh, the service will continue to be available all throughout 2021, but will start, uh, but will be discontinued at the start of the following year. Um, so complimentary transportation is still available within the resort with the buses, the monorail, the Skyliner. Um, and a Disney spokesperson had told all ears Dot net, which is where this article had come from, that while the mini van service still does not have a return date, they are hoping to bring it back in the future. And the mini van service was kind of like their Uber on site. Um, but you could actually, I think, take it to some places relatively close by off site, I believe. We've never we never used it because we've been taking our own vehicle uh, for many years. So obviously for those who are traveling between the Orlando International Airport and Disney World in the future, you know, now you're going to have to find your own way uh, to get there. But there is some good news because uh, they are uh, a bright line, which is a um, rail system that they're planning on building. It's actually from South Florida up to the Orlando area and in Disney Springs. They are actually planning to do a line from the Orlando airport to Disney Springs. So, but that's, you're looking at like the end of 2022, maybe even 2023 at this point. So there will be that available. But of course, again, you know, if you saw anything online or any, uh, you know, Disney forum, everybody is like, how are we going to get to Disney now? Blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking, you know, Magical Express hasn't always been around. If, you know, yes, it's been around for a, a, a while now and people got accustomed to it. But for many years, you had to find your own way to, you know, so that Disney. was, I guess that's the <clears throat> first question that I have. Is right. What is the history of Magical Express? When it first was implemented, it was to support the cruise line, wasn't it? Right. Not? When it first started, and I want to say in the late 90s, I don't, I, I meant to look up the date of when it actually started. When they first started doing any kind of transportation, um, that you didn't have to pay for. It was actually through the cruise line. If you booked a land and sea package, they picked you up at the airport and then they would take you, you know, to your resort. And then when you had to go, uh, to your cruise, depending on if you were, if you were going to the cruise first, they would take you to the cruise and then from the cruise to the park and park to the airport or, you know, whichever version of, of your trip that you had. Well, then they saw that this was something that they could do. And I actually remember that um, some of my trips, and this was back when I actually traveled uh, alone. I, I did two Disney trips alone. They actually had, um, when you made your reservation, you could make a reservation with mirrors and <clears throat> book your stay. Mirrors being the transportation company. Mirrors being the company that actually... Too that's who does the the magical express now so back then you could get i don't know it was like 25 dollars round trip but you had to get your own luggage and then once you had your luggage you went downstairs you had a voucher and they would you know take you to whichever resort you know they had basically how they do magical express now in some respects um the one thing that magical express started doing that Basically, you know, I, I could see why people, um, how people could be, um, <laughs> you know, upset or, you know, one of the things that, you know, they're going to miss is when you use Magical Express, you get special luggage tags. So when you go to your airport and you drop off your luggage, that's the last time that you see your luggage until it comes to your resort room. Yeah, now that was something that was always 
going and and leaving right. was always convenient was that right. you never had to handle your you luggage. You never had to handle your luggage. So when you get to Orlando International Airport, you basically got off the plane and you went right to a Magical Express bus, you know, and they would say that your luggage should arrive within roughly three hours of, of your flight. Um, so that the idea was that once you got to the, the, uh, the park or the resort, you could go and do whatever. You didn't have to wait around for anything. So you, you would check in at your home airport. Mm -hmm. You'd check your luggage there. You'd yep. get on the plane. You'd get off the plane in Orlando. Yep. They would handle your luggage. Yep. You would go down to the far furthest <laughs> possible right. 12 mile walk to the end of, of the transportation uh -huh. side. Yeah, yeah. They'd put you on a bus. Right. They'd drive you to the resorts. Right. Uh, you'd get a little movie. In, right. You know, in the, mm -hmm. in the process right. there. They would go through drop off at multiple resorts. You get dropped right. off at your resort. They would then bring the luggage from the airport. Mm hmm. They would handle it at the concierge desk, mm -hmm. and then they would deliver it to your room right. at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then when you left, you would drop off your luggage at check-in in the front. Right, because then what they started doing was they started doing airline check-in at the resorts. Right. So instead of having to, you know, take your luggage to the airport and do online, you know, and do the check-in for your flight going home, you were able to do all of that at your resort, again, say goodbye to your luggage. Your luggage would end up, you know, going on its own. You would then get a ride from your resort to the airport. You'd get on your flight, and then you'd get to, you know, get home, and then you'd and then actually you would have hope to. If you like, for <laughs> hope. us, we fly into Philly. You would hope that your luggage that your luggage up. actually it, shows it up. It didn't always show up. But right. That wasn't always Disney's fault. Right. Because sometimes that was, you know. So just, with this going away, right. does that mean that the the airport check in at the resorts going away as well? That's again what people are trying to figure out. And as of right now, nothing's really come out. Is the airline checking going away? Is that, you because know? Because this was a lot more than just a ride from the airport oh, to the absolutely. airport. Oh, absolutely. The logistics And were that was complex. the thing was that it, it started, again, this all started with the cruise line because when you took a cruise, it was the same thing. You had special luggage tags so that you didn't have to touch your luggage until you got you know, to the resort. And then if you did um, the land and then the sea, they came and picked up your luggage at the resort. You didn't even have to bring it somewhere. And then they would bring it to the cruise as well. So they got used to that, yeah. you know, uh, the logistics of it. And then it just grew. And you figure it's been, you know, 20 years maybe. That they've been doing that. So I could definitely see, you know, people that haven't been going to Disney as long or, or have been and then have just gotten so used to this and now it's gone. Now, I'm surprised that they didn't start maybe still offering it, but now you have to pay right. for it. Um, mm. Because, again, you figure it's already in place. The system, as far as I know, really hasn't had too many glitches. I could definitely see, you know, a huge family that, you know, doesn't want to have to, you know, rent a car or, or get a van or bring car seats or, you know, when you do those big family vacations. I could see them saying, hey, listen, let me pay, you know, a couple hundred bucks and not have to worry about all of that, you sure. know, other stuff. So, yeah. again, as of right now, no no news as to what's going on. But, again, there's always ways to get to, you know, the, the resort, um, you know, from the airport. Obviously, it's not something that's going to be um, complimentary anymore. Right. So. Well, just one more thing we're losing. Spe speaking of that, let's let's talk about <laughs> something else that we're losing on our West Coast. Yeah, so for uh, our West Coast Disney people, it seems that Disneyland is ending the annual pass program because of the pandemic. Um, 
you know, Disneyland uh, is ending the program. It's been now 10 months that the theme park has been shut down. Um, and obviously there's no horizon, uh, you know, as to when the park is going to be open. Uh, so they had issued a statement that it would also be, uh, begin issuing prorated refunds to eligible pass holders. So it said, due to the continued uncertainty of the pandemic and limitations around the reopening of our California theme parks, we will be issuing appropriate refund refunds for eligible Disneyland Resort annual pass holders um, and unsetting the current program. Uh, so Disney didn't say how many people this was going to affect or how much money you know, the company would be, uh, you know, ha losing, you know, at this point. Um, it also, the announcement came the same day that Disneyland has now allowed county health officials to use its parking lot for large scale coronavirus vaccination sites. So, you know, at least something good, I guess, is being done on Disney property, um, you know, but it is kind of you know, unsettling. Um, obviously, again, no dates as to when things will be opening up. Um, you know, obviously, once the transmission rates start lowering, uh, Disneyland is hoping, hoping to open at 25% capacity. And just like how Disney World did it with reservations being required for the specific days that, that you're going. So, again, right now, you know, so just kinda... one more thing that Disney's doing away with that that at least the locals have certainly taken advantage right. of. Right, and and honestly, I think once things kind of get to a more normal atmosphere, I can't imagine that they wouldn't bring bring it back. I can't imagine them now is this completely doing away with it. I think it was them more shutting it down just because they aren't open at this point in time. And that's the, and, and that's, I think really what it kind of comes down to is that, you know, and, and that's the thing is they have so many different types of annual passes. Um, you know, the biggest one is the coast to coast pass where you have Disneyland and Disney world. So I'm sure that's still available for people that, you know, that, that tr do a lot of traveling and, 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 and go to both parks. Um, but if you figure the park hasn't been close, you know, hasn't been opened in 10 months, what's the point in paying for an annual pass for a park? Yeah. Uh, you know, because they do their, their park passes, you know, day to day. So if you, you know, got it today, you have 365 days, you know, it's not like, you know, some seasonal, uh, parks you know around here where if you get an annual park it's just for this you know calendar year or whatever the season is so and they did mention in the article <clears throat> that they were planning on putting some other program mm -hmm. in place it's still under development they just aren't ready to it right it. and that's probably you know what it is they're probably trying to figure out because i'm sure once the park opens again you're still gonna have to make a reservation to go you know, there's going to be some sort of limitation. So maybe it's one of the, you know, maybe it's kind of, I could almost see them doing maybe like the multi-day, like a multi-day park hopper type ticket where, okay, this is good for 12 visits, you know? So it's kind of, you know, and you have a year to use it in you know, type thing. So I could kind of see them maybe starting something like that until the park is open at, you know, a hundred percent capacity, um, you know, for, for those. Cause you figure, you know, the locals, how often are they going? Are they going, right. you know, every day or are you going, you know, every couple of weekends? So do you really need something that gives you 365 days of access or do you only need something that gives you like 24? So so that was all we had for our Disney detective this week. We'll take a quick break and come back with our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly, and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, 
annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Civ Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. from the edge of the galaxy. Pew, 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 pew. No more pew, pew. I can pew, pew if I want to. So, as you had teased about in our opening, uh, exclusive Star Wars news. Woo! Hardcore Star Wars fans uh, know that one of the best Star Wars stories ever told didn't happen on the screen, and it happened in the Star Wars novels. Now we've learned that the story is finally coming to the screen, and Lucasfilms is working towards adapting Heir to the Empire. Obviously, we've gotten a, some hints uh, with the Mandalorian, uh, because we got to finally hear Grand Admiral Thrall's name, Thrawn. Thrawn's name, mentioned. So, of course, that was the... <gasps> Well, and four people like also <clears throat> appeared in uh, Rebels as well. True. So you know, obviously, you would know a little bit more about that. He's also know? got several novels now too. Right. He he has a lot of books. <laughs> so so obviously, uh, w you know, the news kind of came out that they're going to be doing some crossover events that'll kind of you know culminate in an adaptation of the book heir to the empire um and that was the first novel uh where thrawn in the thrawn trilogy uh it was originally published in 1991 and it tells the story of the new republic trying to hang on to control of the galaxy after defeating the empire at the battle of endor uh it involves the imperial remnant uh reforming under the leadership of the brilliant uh grand admiral whose name is Thrawn. He has a kitty, right? He, he has a he, little kitty. Yeah, he doesn't anymore, though. He does. He got rid of the kitty? Yeah, no more Oh, kitty. that's well, so The sad. kitty shows up in this oh, one. Oh, does it? Oh, okay. Yeah, see, I remember when you played uh, your, your Star Wars miniature game, and I remember his little character, and he had, like, this little Yeah, the kitty -like. shows up in the novel because it, it creates a bubble where the force doesn't work around them. Oh, uh, so that's why the kitty's there. Right. Um, so again, we got teased about it in The Mandalorian Season 2 when, um, you know, uh, Ahsoka is on the hunt and she's obviously looking for him. So we know now he is part of canon and will be making his debut. And what was really funny was there was uh, a tweet from... I think it was one of the congressmen from Georgia that just got elected and he he tweeted something like Thrawn is the new trilogy? Question mark question mark. And everyone thought that Thrawn should have been the trilogy. So, you know, so obviously one a new Star, War, you know, now now we know of a, another Star Wars fan, not that, you know, we didn't know that there were a lot out there. there are? Any, there's a few. There's a couple, couple. out there. Couple, five or six million, billion. Um, so obviously now more talk about this. So obviously I never read any of the novels. You're very big on all the novels. I don't think there's one that you haven't read. I had, there's some of the new stuff I haven't read because it's just drunk. Right, but overall you've read all the the good stuff. All so the, all the classics, all the all the right. So I think you could probably speak to the the fans, you know, that are the hardcore you know, novel fans, because again, we've talked about this, how certain novels were canon, certain weren't, and now it's kind of nice that they're getting this one in because this is a character that you've always well, and, enjoyed. And this this novel series, which <clears throat> came out in, in the 90s, mm -hmm. really resurrected the franchise at the time because it was sort of dying out. You were getting these, you know, director release cuts that Lucas was putting out. but 
you got to remember, this came out before mm-hmm. the prequel trilogy. The right. prequel trilogy didn't come out till 99. Mm-hmm. And this was what really jump started interest in the franchise again. And mm-hmm. everybody loved it. I mean, Timothy Zahn is a, is a brilliant, brilliant writer. Uh, he writes it at it, such a complex level and has so many working parts in all the novels that he does that it keeps you enthralled the entire time. Mm-hmm. And this novel itself, this novel series itself, introduced us to characters who who were mainstays in the canon up until the point where Disney took over and, and basically made it all legends. Right. So you had great character development. This is where Mara Jade shows up. Mm-hmm. So you you eventually see Luke and, and Mara Jade have a child and that that spawns more and it was, so much came out of this trilogy, and it's poignant to what we're seeing now mm-hmm. because one of the concepts they introduced in this trilogy was the concept of clones mm. and generating clones and okay. force-sensitive clones and stuff like that. And there's even, later in the novel series itself, there's a element that was, I think, borrowed in uh, The Expanse with making rocks that you can't see that are oh, threatening planets. Oh, okay, okay. So a lot of stuff that's not even Star Wars kind of springboarded off of this series, okay, too. Okay, so I it was see just that. So well written, and when it came out, everyone who read it thought this was going to be the perfect sequel trilogy because it was set in the right time period. Mm-hmm. It was had all the right characters in it. It had a great story, and it had a handoff point at the end there. Okay. So at the end of the trilogy, you could have had a legitimate handoff to the next generation. Um, so it was literally the 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 probably the perfect trilogy that you could have springboarded off of. And Lucas didn't do anything. He backtracked. He did the prequels and then sold off to Disney. And you know we have what we have today. Well, and maybe now with you know John Favreau, you know taking such a positive step towards everything and being such the fanboy that he is we're gonna get what you know that is what you've been looking for but is favreau heading up this project they haven't released the right they haven't released any information but it's very possible that this could go to patty jenkins and after that (laughs) spaghetti mess of a movie that <laughs> Wonder Woman 1984 mess. was, I really don't want to see her take something like this over. Mm. So, but anyway, it's good we'll news say. anyway. They're resurrecting one of the best novels in mm-hmm. the history of Star Wars, bringing it back in. Uh, they've brought elements and pieces of it here and there, but it's definitely going to be nice to see it come mm-hmm. back in. Yeah. So what else do we have in Star Wars? So, and then in on the gaming side of things, uh, Ubisoft uh, announced the open world Star Wars game. They announced that they would be working on an open world game set in the Star Wars universe. Um, it, it's, and there hasn't really been too much uh, talk of what it was going to kind of be like I know I had heard on the radio they were even talking about and trying to figure out is it something where you know it's kind of all players is it all time frames there I don't think there was really much about it but the big news like you had mentioned that th- this uh, is the first time that a company outside of EA is going to produce a Star Wars game since Disney acquired Lucasfilms in 2012. Uh, EA has famously produced Star Wars games for nearly eight years, and now here is a chance, you know, for someone else to to step in and and produce some of these uh, some of these games. Well, we say they famously <laughs> produced them uh, for well, eight years, and I think a more apt description would be infamously produced. Okay, them. you know, you've got they re- they resurrect it. Battlefront. So mm-hmm. you got Battlefront 1, Battlefront 2 out of them, mm-hmm. which was a remake of a game that Lucasfilm had put out uh, years ago. And they eventually got it right, but they were terrible to start out. In fact, in fact, Battlefront, Battlefield Front 1 was still not a very good game. Battlefront 2 they came out with, 
and the gameplay was okay. The story was all right. They, they stuck elements of the continuing Star Wars story in the game itself. So parts of that emerged in Mandalorian and, and the sequel trilogy. The problem you run into is that nobody knows because mm. very few, you know, casual fans played the game and, and played it for the story. Okay. So this sort of goes back into the methodology that they had before where they're sticking, sticking story elements in places people aren't going to see them. Mm. But um, EA is famous for monetizing their games. So there was a True. lot of controversy about the pay to win aspect of uh, Battlefront when it came out. Uh, they recently released uh, Squadrons, which is uh, okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, it was, it was riddled with bugs when it came out. Right, and, you right. Know, pretty much everything having... that, that EA comes out with. But the big game that EA has right now is Star Wars The Old Republic, which mm -hmm. is a, the, the current open world as much as, as open as it can be. Right. But prior to this, the only other open world Star Wars game you had was Star Wars Galaxies that was put out by Sony. Mm -hmm. And that was huge. That was a huge universe compared to what you get with Star Wars The Old Republic. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, when, when Star Wars The Old Republic came out, it was kind of disappointing that it was very different. It was a very cookie-cutter MMO-style game that was very limited, very small in scope compared to what Galaxies was. And it, it was just people were expecting kind of Galaxies 2, and it wasn't, mm. it wasn't along those lines. So... Another open world Star Wars game, I think, would be welcome if it was along the lines of Galaxy. Mm -hmm. uh, but the fact that EA is not the only company that's in the game now making these, mm -hmm. whether it's Ubisoft or whoever else is out there, opening that license up, I think, is probably the smartest thing that Disney's done so far with the, the gaming licenses. I would love to see them do the same thing with their tabletop gaming. Mm. Yeah, you know when when I was into Star Wars miniatures, you had and you Wizards. were really really into it. Yeah, <coughs> um, Wizards of the Coast had the license, mm -hmm. and they eventually wound up giving up the license to Fantasy Flight. And I just do not like fantasy the mechanics that Fantasy Flight does. It's mm -hmm. a very proprietary system that they use. They use their own dice, their own markers, you know, their own accessories and. You know, if you want to play their game, you've got to buy it from them, and they are exceedingly expensive mm -hmm. as far as games go. Right. Whereas with uh, the Wizards of the Coast, it was a D20 based game. So right. you go out and buy that stuff anywhere you want. Mm -hmm. uh, it just made a lot more sense. But the other thing is, is that Lucas has always been notorious about its licensing. Right. Like it's one of those things where it's Star Wars, right? So. You'll make money no matter what. Like people are going to buy it. Right, right. The the sequel trilogy kind of kind of proves that. No matter how bad it is, Star You're Wars still, fans right. are still going to buy it. Right, right. But they have exceedingly high demands traditionally. Uh, there's a high cost of licensing it, so your profit margins are significantly reduced. But they also exert a tremendous amount of control over it. Uh, like for instance, there were stories when. I was into Star Wars miniatures where they would come out with a set uh, every f three to four months. Mm -hmm. And the set usually consisted of 60 figures. Well, every single one of those figures had to go through its development phase and get approval from, from Lucas mm -hmm. with all their abilities and everything else before they could even be allowed to make the thing. Wow. And and they exerted some of the same control over the games here, and mainly, meaning, <coughs> excuse me, uh, mainly because of the story elements involved. Okay. So Lucasfilm has kind of a reputation for being one of the more difficult licensing companies out there to work with when you're making their products. Uh, the figures are the same way. Mm -hmm. you know, Hasbro had the figures, and right. everything has to be approved at the highest level. Um, so opening this up. I don't know if it's going to make the process better, but I think giving it to someone other than EA who 
these days come across really as just a bunch of software mercenaries at this point. They mm-hmm. want to crank something out and they want to milk it for as much as they can get and it ruins the experience. So hopefully having this open up here is going to be a good thing for everybody, you know, not just Disney and Star Wars, but for all the fans as well. So good news all around, Mm -hmm. uh, bad news on the Disney front and uh, good news on the Star Wars (laughs) front. So at least there's something positive. There's a, there's a good trade there. There you go. (coughs) So let's take a quick break. I'll get a drink and clear my throat and we'll be back with our entertainment news of the week. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Go for entertainment news. <laughs> so Chris Evans is reportedly in talks to reprise his role as Captain America in a future MCU film, and the news has sent fans into a frenzy. So according to Deadline, there is no official confirmation that a deal has been finalized, but sources av- advise the outlet that Evans and Marvel have been discussing it and that he is open to returning. Uh, Deadline noted that it reached out to Marvel about the rumors and the company has no comment. Uh, Evans had made it clear in the past that he was not picking the shield back up after Avengers Endgame and had even passed the mantle to uh, Anthony Mackie's character, Sam Wilson, at the end of the film. Uh, so now, you know, there's a lot of speculation as to how he could even return. Uh, would it be through time travel? Would it be a multiverse storyline being introduced? Obviously, possibilities, you know, are kind of endless. Uh, But again, Twitter was all abuzz with, you know, news that this could possibly happen. And everybody was just like, yes, of course we want you back. So, you know, who knows? Maybe it'll be true. Maybe, you know, just kind of hearsay to kind of bring some light to the MCU who, you know, who knows, but it would be kind of interesting to see how they would do. I could totally see them doing it as like a flashbacky type um, thing. But again, you know, we haven't seen any of like the new stuff as to where the timeline goes yet after uh, end game. So it should be, you know, interesting well, the other to thing that's worth noting is, Marvel is famous for killing characters and bringing them back mm-hmm. and for multiple universes. Right, and, right. You know, we've got um, Doctor Strange coming out with the multiverse. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have uh, Spider-Man and the Spider-Verse. So there's different parallel universes that right. this could happen mm-hmm. in. They've already obviously dabbled in time travel. Right. So you might see that. Uh, there's a history. Uh, there was one comic series that I read that was, was actually very good where uh, Captain America meets Wolverine in World War II and, and they okay. wind up fighting together in, in World War II. So there there could be a whole offshoot of that where it mm-hmm. has nothing to do with what the current phase of the Marvel Cinematic mm-hmm. Universe is in. Right, right. So there's so much that they can do that the possibilities really are endless on this one. Mm-hmm. I would certainly welcome it. Uh, he probably was, you know, outside of 
Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark, he probably embodied the character that he portrayed more than just about anybody else. Mm, yeah, yeah. Perfect for the character. Especially after they had him as Human Torch in Fantastic Four before <laughs> that. Didn't really right. fit too well on that one. Right, right. But it's a great character. It's mm-hmm. a character that has, has been a a leading figure, a, a commanding figure in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And I think not having that character. And just the Marvel Universe, you know, right. f- for so long, you know, as well. So right. how can you just not have a Captain America? Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, we look at the tragic loss of Chadwick Boseman, who was a mm-hmm. rising star who was going to yeah. take over that leading role in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Mm-hmm. And we have this vacancy now that right. I, I think you kind of need to bring Cap back in, mm-hmm. fill that gap until we can we can find a, a more permanent solution right. there. Yeah. So, but anyway, good news if if he is coming back. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what else do we have? We've got Walking Dead news, don't we? So yeah, so Walking Dead is actually going to be returning for an extended season ten. Um, that'll be it'll be six new episodes. Uh, that'll be happening in February. Um, season ten kind of uh, it had ended. They didn't get to show the season finale because COVID had hit and they were still in post-production and things like that. And then they kind of extended, uh, they, they kind of added on to the season and added these six extra episodes, which will be coming out. And this is where we will now get to see Negan and Maggie meeting again, um, where they haven't seen each other, um, in more than seven years when they uh, had a conflict in, in season nine. So this will be kind of a, a big deal because obviously uh, there is no love loss between these two characters since Negan kind of uh, Negan made Maggie a, a widow uh, since he was the one that that killed off Glenn, uh, which there are still people that are very bitter about that, even though it had happened in the comics years before. And I know plenty of people that actually stopped watching Walking Dead after that happened because they were like, how could you do that? I'm like, well, they they knew it was going <laughs> to happen. It was already in the comics. But anyway, uh, so it'll be interesting to to see how their their paths cross uh they had done a virtual table read uh back in october and there was a clip that kind of came out and uh <clears throat> so maggie kind of tells negan oh you're out um and he goes well i didn't escape if that's what you're thinking um then con- it seems that carol confesses to maggie about letting him out of jail and explains that they were about to lose everything and that he actually helped with the plot of the whisperers and you know after they lost so many of their people because of it this was really the only thing you know that they could do so it'll be interesting to see you know how she reacts to you know to all of this and and the other interesting thing is that we're going to see um some backstory from Negan uh we're going to see what life was like before everything happened and his real life wife uh is actually playing lucille in these flashbacks so that'll be kind of uh interesting to to see as well so they they return the end of february uh you know for six episodes so looking forward to it yeah i think it's very cool i'm I'm excited to get maggie back in the Mm -hmm. the mix of things right i think we kind of know the direction that it's going assuming it's it's right to the comic uh, timeline and so forth. Right. So that'll be a dramatic turn for the show itself. And, you know, we absolutely love Jeffrey Dean Moore. Oh, He's absolutely. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it'll definitely be good to see him come back mm-hmm. and see what that dynamic is. Yeah. Is like. Yeah. So that was all we had for our entertainment news this week. Yep. We'll be right back with our insightful picks of the week. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick is a documentary. Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) That never happens. Um, 
this is one that actually popped up um, on my Netflix uh, after, like, hey, things you might be interested in. Um, we things had, with English accents. <laughs> things with English accents. How'd you know? Um, uh, so uh, this popped up after we had finished uh, the f- the uh, most recent episode uh, season of The Crown. Um, so the documentary is The Royal House of Windsor, um, and it actually came out in 2017. So uh, not as up to date as some of the other documentaries, but again, you know, pretty pretty up to date for the most part. Um uh, the documentary series explores the history of the Windsor dynasty, which was founded in 1917 when Germany and Britain were at war. A combination of new research and evidence, assistance from family insiders, and access to Windsor Castle's royal archives has provided an understanding of how this royal family has survived a century of great change. We learn how George V rebranded the family from its uh, original German roots, and now Edward uh, the Eighth almost ruined the dynasty with his advocation in uh, 1936. Uh, what's really interesting is again watching the crown, um, and we know that there's parts of it that are uh, the um, the fabrication of creative uh, the creative license uh, of the story. But what's interesting is to see in the documentary how much they really do follow, you know, the, the timeline and, and, you know, most of the events. Um, because what was interesting to see was certain scenes play out, uh, film footage and, and, and whatnot in the documentary that we saw reenacted in the crown. So it was kind of a, a nice, um, accompanied, uh, uh, show to watch if it's something that you're interested in the crown and want to know a little bit more history, uh, behind certain things. Uh, you know, it, it does a very good job of, you know, it, it it there's a whole uh you know thing where they talk about you know the queen mother and you really don't see it as much in the crown you you see it a little bit but you you understand more of her power and how powerful she really was long after her daughter became queen like she didn't want to let go of being queen she felt she still had you know more to do and and how much um you know behind the scenes stuff she really did and then you get to see also with uh prince philip and princess diana how much they had in common because they were outsiders to the rest of of the family and and how much they kind of you know prince philip actually tried to help her in in certain things when when things started you know going downhill and um so very interesting again it, it plays up until uh, um you know 2017 so it's again pretty pretty recent um and and again if you're a fan of the crown this is a nice little you know tide you over until the next season because again because it, it's a little bit more current you can kind of get little hints as to where the crown for the next season might be going with more of these future, you know, things going on. Okay. Great pick. Thank you. So my pick this week is not a documentary. It's actually kind of a bit of a retread that I've had in the past. And that is the expanse season five. Now I've been a huge fan of the expanse. since. Yes, you have very early on. I've read all the books. Uh, I'm anxiously, if not impatiently, waiting uh, book nine to be released uh, in the coming months to kind of finish out the whole story. Mm -hmm. But season five actually centers around the novel Nemesis Games, and it includes some plot elements from the novel Babylon's Ashes. Uh, So the season premiered December 16th. Uh, Three episodes dropped at release, and then they're releasing on a weekly basis each Wednesday up until February 3rd. So we're about five in, I think at this point. I think so. So we're pretty far into the, the season right now. Season five of the series picks up as multitudes of humans leave the solar system 
in search of new homes and vast fortunes on the earth-like worlds beyond the alien ring, and a heavy price for centuries of exploitation of the belt finally comes due and a reckoning is at hand. For the crew of the Rosalanti and the leaders of the inner planets and the belt, the past and present converge, bringing forth personal challenges that have wide-reaching repercussions throughout the solar system. In different parts of the solar system, the crew of the Rosinanti and their allies confront the sins of their past, while Marco Anarios unleashes an attack that will alter the future of Earth, Mars, the Belt, and the worlds beyond the ring. Dun, dun, dun. The novel itself was, was very well done. And when I read the novel, I tried to envision how they were going to pull off some of the effects that happened in mm-hmm. the novel. And I didn't think they were going to do it very well. So in watching the series and seeing how they're doing these, these scenes, I'm very impressed. You can tell that Amazon, since they've taken it over, have really dropped a lot of money in the budget. You're mm-hmm. getting a lot of great cinematic shots, especially the space shots. You're seeing some of the externals of the space stations now. They're doing a fantastic job with it. The story picks up right where it left off. Mm-hmm. It sticks very closely to the novels. but And that's kind of how the, the, the rest of the series seasons have gone as well. They've, mm-hmm. they've made changes because there's eight novels right now that are out. And then there's a couple of novellas that are out that are short stories that accompany them. And the previous seasons have actually incorporated the short stories into the seasons themselves. You'll remember the one episode where they discru- they the uh, discover the Epstein Drive, right? You know, has that that was actually out of a no- uh, one of the novellas. Okay. Um, so there's an episode out of the one of the the novellas that's coming up in this season too which should mm-hmm. be very interesting because it really contributed to some of the backstory of one of the key characters um, so the season itself is fantastic i can't wait to watch the rest of it and assuming that amazon is going to continue with it it should be a great story moving forward because there's a lot of great stuff mm-hmm. left to tell from the novels in this so the expanse season five available now on amazon prime So I think that was all we had this week. Yep. Uh, do we have any closing thoughts or anything like that? No, not that I can think of. All right. Well, before we go, I do want to invite folks to subscribe to the podcast since I neglected to do so at the top of the podcast. That's okay. Um, you can find audio versions of the podcast listed as insights into entertainment and video versions are listed as insights into things. And that includes all of the network's podcasts. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Amazon, uh, Pandora, and pretty much any place else that you can get a podcast at this point. Uh, We would also invite folks to reach out to us. Give us your feedback. Tell us what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. Or you can find us on Twitter where we haven't been banned at insights (laughs) underscore things. We're on Twitch. At twitch.tv slash insights into things. On Facebook at facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast. We are on Instagram at insights into things. Oh, the audio version of all of our podcast. I was expecting you to say (laughs) line. Uh, The audio versions of all of our podcasts are at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. And you can get high res versions of our podcasts at youtube.com slash insights into things where we're also not banned where we're also not banned and on the web if you missed any of those links and not sure where to to find us go to insights into things.com and that'll find everything everything uh and that's it uh, another one in the books we're done have a good week everyone bye bye <laughs>